Hello, I am so excited for today's podcast, truly. I think it is going to be an episode that so many of you will love. I got the idea for this podcast a couple of weeks ago. I rejoined lab meetings to the lab that I previously was in. And for lab meetings, we often read scientific papers. And the paper that was chosen was about science communication. It was about social media and the effectiveness of hashtags. But really the paper led us down a road of talking about volunteering in other countries, something that we call volunteerism. And one of my former lab mates, Matt Snyder, had a lot of really great insight to say, and he had one of these volunteerism experiences. I frequently have people reach out to me saying that they feel they need to do one of these experiences or that they want to do one of these experiences, but that they can't make it happen financially or they're just unsure for some reason. So I decided to have Matt on the podcast today and I interviewed him all about his experience and we have a great discussion about volunteering and volunteerism and especially as it relates to volunteering abroad, particularly in Africa. Matt and I have both worked in different African countries. Matt has worked in Africa for eight years. I didn't realize it was that much and he has a ton of knowledge. I learned a lot from our discussion today and I know you are too. So enjoy. Hi, Matt. Welcome to the Fancy Scientist podcast. I'm so excited to have you and see the old lab. Yeah, it's always good to catch up with you as well. I'm sitting like one seat down from where you used to sit here in the biodiversity lab at the museum. So it's always exciting to kind of catch up over old times. I miss it. An old post came up where I took a picture of myself in the lab and I talked about how I wanted to work on Women's Day because it's a fishbowl so people can see the scientists there. I miss it. But I do like working from home. It is nice that I don't have to get dressed up all the time. But anyway, so I invited you on this podcast for a bunch of reasons, but really what triggered it is I started joining lab meetings again, and we had a really good talk about a paper about volunteering and specifically volunteering abroad, which you call volunteerism. And I'm sure other people call it that too, but that was the first time that I heard about it. So why don't you just take a minute to talk about what that is, how it differs from regular volunteering? Yeah, I think there's a pretty strong bifurcation between volunteering and volunteerism. Volunteering, as a lot of people understand, tends to be you donating your time in exchange for building on some experiences, maybe trying to build new skill sets that you might not have with organizations that you're trying to network with. Volunteerism tends to be a much more money-centered enterprise, and it has really grown in popularity over the last kind of 15 years, but it has really blown up in scope, I would say, in the last six or seven years from what I've been able to discern. Volunteerism has kind of taken the shape of having... People pay for uh, closer experiences with wildlife in a not specifically tourism setup, kind of couching those wildlife experiences under the guise of conservation or under the guise of research. And there has been a number of organizations that have popped up to kind of feed on this idea that, oh, you're helping the animals, but you do have to pay money for this kind of quality of experience. And now they're spread out in a lot of uh, the developing world, especially where you could have better access to some of this wildlife. It has become really popular for people from the developed world to come there as a volunteerist to kind of get these premium experiences with animals. And there's a little bit of a debate right now in the quality of experience if you're looking to build research-specific skill sets for potential future employment or grad school success or something like that. Yeah. In lab meeting, we talked about the importance of experience and that often you have to volunteer 
And a big problem right now that people are talking about is that only certain kinds of people can volunteer because you, you need the time to do that. And some people don't have the luxury to be able to do that. You need that kind of experience. But then for these, you also have the added payment on top of it that you're paying to do it. And I was interested in talking to you about this because there's a lot of people who post to my Facebook group or who I talk to directly through messaging, and they think that they need to do these experiences. I want to talk to you about that. But before we get into that, let's just clarify that there's exceptions to every generality that we're talking about today. So there are volunteers who just volunteer because they want to help. They're not doing it for any career reason. Mm -hmm. And then there are people who do it for a career reason, but of course they want to help too. I mean, that's why they're going into this career. And then there are volunteerists who do it to help and, or have that experience and are not interested in the wildlife field as a career. And then there are people who are as well. Yes. And there can be a bit of that conflation where people are led to believe that being a volunteerist will likely increase their prospects for bringing wildlife in as a career later on. It's a bit of a mixed bag and it really depends on the specific organizations that you volunteerist with. Why don't you first tell us about how you started off in your career and how you ended up doing a volunteerism experience and what it was like? So going into my undergraduate experience, I actually didn't have that much exposure to a wide kind of variety of different jobs that can be working with animals. I'd kind of come up in a pretty rural background where your experiences with animals are going to be as a farmer or as a farm vet. And mm -hmm. those were the two options. If you were interested in animals, those were kind of the options that were kind of advertised. Once I got into the University of Maryland and I started having a greater variety of experiences and started seeing wildlife as more of a career potential, mm -hmm. I started trying to find experiences that I could build away from the vet track and more onto the wildlife conservation track. As part of that, I started volunteering, like actual volunteering, just donating my time and that kind of thing at the National Zoo as one of the zookeeper aides. And from there, I got a much better sense that I was interested in animal behavior and specifically wildlife behavior. And from there, I started exploring more options to try to see where I could develop my skill set in order to possibly pursue wildlife conservation or wildlife research as a career field later on. When I was finishing my undergraduate, one of my peers actually put me on track for one of these conservation research experiences in South Africa with an organization called Global Visions International. And they were one of these early volunteerist organization. So I applied onto that project my final semester of undergrad and I was accepted and I went to South Africa as a volunteerist initially uh, a month after I graduated from my undergrad. I will say that at the time the framework for volunteerist experience was a little bit different. It wasn't nearly as expensive as it is today. So I paid I think maybe $4,000 for a three-month experience. And I actually was looking at the Global Visions International website like just before we started talking. And the price for that same experience has more than doubled since I did it back in 2009. And I think that's a reflection of the fact that volunteerism as its own kind of business model has really exploded in popularity. I will say I went into my volunteerism experience with a mindset that I really wanted to make it worth my while. It was a lot of money at the time. I saved a lot to be able to do it, but I also went out of my way to try to make that experience work for me from a career perspective. Global Visions International actually introduced me to a lot of these skill sets that I found incredibly valuable later on in my career path things like VHF radio telemetry, like a lot of research hard skills, like VHF radio telemetry, how to do behavioral sampling, animal tracking, being able to log data, both GIS data and also behavioral data in order mm -hmm. to archive it properly. 
but it also gave me a lot of soft skills that I ended up using later on, how to interact and communicate with stakeholders, be they management organizations for national parks or local landowners. I also learned a bunch of the other um, skills like how to navigate safely in the bush. They taught me wildlife first aid and things like that. So they allowed me to build a lot of skill sets that I just hadn't had the opportunity to build here in the States. And then at the end of the three months that I paid for, I actually volunteered to be an intern with that organization. And I was able to get that internship, which was really beneficial for me because I went from being a paying member of the expedition to now my room and board and visa costs were being paid for, which means that I was now further enhancing my research experiences and not paying for it. But I also was able to build other skill sets that proved to be really vital later on. A lot of the people management, because now I was in charge of training certain skill sets within the new volunteers coming through, a lot of conflict resolution things, because everybody lives on a very small, very remote base where you had to be self-sufficient out in the bush. And then it gave me better insight into the project management side of things because I was responsible for making sure that the data integrity was always at the highest quality so that you had research quality outputs in terms of data because Global Visions International was partnered with graduate students who were using that data for their thesis and dissertation work. And then at the end of that three months as an intern, they actually extended my time there because they had a high rotation of their permanent staff. Some of them were leaving to go have children. Some of them were getting married and going to positions that were closer to their spouses. So then I was responsible for teaching a lot of these research hard skills to a new set of permanent staff that was coming into the site. So I ended up staying in South Africa for almost a year and the volunteerism section of that opportunity was actually only for the first three months, but because of the networking and really yeah. working on trying to find opportunities to build those research skill sets, I was able to get almost a year of experience from that. And that really opened the door to other research opportunities later on, all of which were paid opportunities where I was hired as a project manager for various research projects. That's great. So this project that you were on, it was very research focused, it sounds like. So you were yes. doing research like every day, all different kinds of research? Yes. So this one, I will say that I was pretty diligent about the volunteerist experiences that I was going into. And this one is a very research centered project. Mm -hmm. You are really trying to build that atmosphere of this is what it le is like to do field, to build those field research experiences, because you're leaving every day from base at six in the morning to start your tracking so that you can be on site with animals to do hill site inspections if we were following the lions or the cheetahs or the leopards so that you could see what pre-species they had been going into. We had a very rigorous metadata log to see what had been determined at the, skill, the kill site, which research study individuals had been present, look at any of the interactions between different demographics, if it was one of the prides of lions. And it was very centered on making sure that all the volunteers knew this is what it was like to be doing field research in the field. And part of that was reinforced by the fact that we had these partnerships with different graduate students, that they had very detailed protocols and procedures, and they needed the data to be rigorously collected on a daily basis. That's great to hear. I had never done one of these projects, but I did do study abroad. And one of the things that I think people can take away from study abroad is that even though you're in a remote area, you're still in a certain kind of setting and research can look very different from that. Just the fact that you have like 
30 students from the United States all in one area. That's still a lot different than being at a field station with you and just a couple of other people. So it's good that they gave you that insight as to what it was like. And then the ones that we were talking about in lab meetings, some of them involved, it sounded like wildlife rehabilitation. Can you comment on that? Yeah. So the fact that organizations like Global Visions International have been so successful in their volunteerism aspects has meant that there has been a very strong surge of other organizations coming into that volunteerism space and offering other experiences. Many of these experiences are based off of wildlife rehabilitation facilities or spaces where they purport to be more on the educational side of wildlife. And many of these are what I view as a little bit different, considerably different from the research side of wildlife. A lot of these are much more hands-on with many of the species and that can kind of change some of the behavioral aspects where animals may not be able to be released back into the wild because they've had so much time kind of losing their fear of humans and things like that. And now it seems like a lot of those experiences are shaped around how much fun a volunteer may be having. And a lot of that can be determined by how much interactions they're having with some of those wildlife. It has kind of turned some of the organizations have definitely turned to be much more touristy in their experiences, and therefore they might advertise as having strong conservation ties, but the actual implementation of what the volunteers are doing on a daily basis is very different from what I view as conservation-related goals. Some of the tasking is constantly you know, cleaning out different enclosures for the animals or preparing all of the daily uh, food intake for the animals. Some of it is socializing some of the animals so they're not quite as dangerous if you're trying to move those animals into more of an educational framework. It might be valuable if you're specifically going to look for a zookeeper position, mm -hmm. but as it relates to wildlife research, I don't feel like those skill sets are as translatable into making you more hireable for other positions that you might be seeing on the Texas A&M job board or on the Society of Conservation Biology job board. And it certainly is not giving you research specific skills that make you more valuable for a grad school experience at a master's or a PhD level. Yeah. And that's what the paper not even hinted at pretty much said is that some of these organizations are more of a business operation and dabble a little bit in, in conservation or do just enough conservation to be able to call themselves that. But it's a tourism operation for people to have wildlife experiences. I do get a lot of people saying they need to do these experiences or wanting to do these experiences. So I have two questions for you. One, do you think that the experiences on their own is enough to lead to other experiences? I know that for yours, it led into this internship. If you didn't have that internship, do you think that having that experience, just the paid experience would help you get future jobs? That's what I'm trying to get at. Or was it the combined internship along with it? I honestly feel like I would have been marginally more noticeable with just my paid experience, mm -hmm. but it was really the fact that I was there practicing these skill sets for almost an entire year. Yeah. And I was able to layer that on top of data management skills and people management mm -hmm. and outreach skills. I think that is what really made me noticeably more hireable. And unfortunately, with some of the way that these more tourist focused volunteerism experiences are, you actually don't have the ability to meet local conservationists as they're conducting that type of research, because it creates this kind of bubble where you as the tourist, they focus so much on delivering what you want as an experience. And in some cases, I feel it's like a more 
TikTok or Insta related experience mm-hmm. rather than a research focused experience where you're specifically focused on skill sets. And I think that division of you kind of being stuck in your tourist experience bubble almost exactly as if you're going to one of these very high priced lodges at one of the, you know, iconic national parks in sub-Saharan Africa, you kind of exist in that bubble that's not reflective of what a lot of the conservation research is out in the field, where you're actually interacting very frequently with local landowners, local stakeholders. You're exposed to a lot of different cultural priorities from pastoralism for semi-nomadic tribes all the way to human wildlife conflict. Many of those perspectives are either very strongly skewed and or shaped by some volunteerist organizations, or they might be completely absent from their narrative altogether. And it makes so that you might not be getting the full conservation perspective or picture when you're on a volunteerist experience, rather than if you're with a conservation organization, because conservation organizations often have to have deep roots with local community stakeholders in order to make tangible positive conservation outcomes. Right. And it's about also who is the consumer. I feel very similar about my study abroad experience where when I studied abroad, yes, I learned a lot, but also is kind of like you're the client or you're the tourist. Mm -hmm. And then when I worked as an intern, it was a totally different experience. And even though I was inside the same world, I felt like outside of the bubble, outside of the study abroad bubble. Yes, Um, absolutely. Yeah. If Somebody is deciding if they should go on one of these experiences. How should they approach evaluating a program? I'm glad you talked more about that because when I was looking at these programs to see if I could give people like some insight on them, what my fear was that people would go and like dabble in these things. So learn a couple of days of radio telemetry, learn a couple of days of this. And then they think they come away with all this experience. But like you said, it's like the day in and day out of doing it over and over again. That's what counts. So how can somebody evaluate these programs or what should they consider? I think it's becoming harder to evaluate them correctly because a lot of the media marketing and advertisement presence on these organizations is becoming very good at kind of only showing you the side that is more likely to draw you in as a client. Mm -hmm. For example, if you go to many of these websites, they will show people in close contact with relatively rare and hard to see species. And that might be an indicator that this might not be a really research centered experience because the vast majority of researchers are not physically handling Mm -hmm. rare wildlife every day. Most of the time, especially on the animal behavior side of things, a human interacting with this animal fundamentally changes that animal's behavior. So if you're seeing a lot of advertisement of very close interactions with multiple species every day, it might reflect a very different experience that is much more catered towards tourism. I would say that the best indicator is probably getting in, trying to get in contact with previous people who have been on that experience. It can be a little bit harder depending on the size of the programs that are out there, because some of these volunteerism programs only bring cohorts of five or six onto their program, but it can be a little bit easier than you expect because a lot of the times if you are surfing through Insta or Facebook or something and you click on a particular organization's kind of Facebook page, you can see lots of people on those Facebook pages, and you'll see comments from a lot of people who have been on those experiences. And some of them are pretty vocal about the quality of their experience. And some of it is good, some of it is bad. But being able to get a perspective of someone who's been there can really tell you whether it's a positive experience. For example, there is an organization in South Africa, relatively close to where I lived and did research, that couched itself as a wildlife rehab facility that was really doing a lot of conservation work. But if you talk to any of the volunteers who were there, they would be able to tell you that this was definitely just a money-making enterprise where 
conservation goals were really not the focus of the organization and therefore their care and husbandry of animals was actually extremely poor no matter how good their marketing was online if you had the first person perspective it was almost uniformly pretty negative but because they were able to bring in a lot of money through their successful marketing they were kind of able to perpetuate this theme this facade of it being a good place for you to go at your cheetahs or whatever. Yeah, that's great advice. I give similar advice to tell people to ask people who've graduated from the program or have gone through that program, but I didn't even think of the Facebook groups. That's really great advice for people out there considering one of these programs. Another thing that I've thought about is, so for you, I think you do want to work somewhere in Africa long-term. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. And so Matt has had a lot of experience working in different countries throughout Africa, but I think most people don't want to work in Africa long-term. I think they want this experience to, I mean, because it's cool. That's why I wanted to go to Kenya too. It was like, I'm never going to get to go to Kenya again. <laughs> like this is a really well, with cool... that attitude. I know. <laughs> and I did get to go again. It's a lot easier than you think, <laughs> but yes. my family did not travel that much. Definitely not out of the United States. So yeah, that was a big deal to me. And I think a lot of people, yeah, they want this experience, but then eventually they'll probably want to return home, have families and stuff like that, but they still want to work in conservation. So I also wonder if the end goal is not necessarily Africa, then is it worth it having this experience and learning these things, or is it better to volunteer at home and not pay and get more of that local experience. Because what happened to me with my PhD is I found that my Africa experience really didn't translate to jobs here. They would think, oh, I know animal behavior. I know how to do research, but really they wanted somebody with local experience and that experience for in reverse, if you do want to work abroad, a program like this might be important for you because they do like to have people who have at the very least experience living abroad. So what would you say about like if somebody's deciding just in general to do one of these projects? I think that's actually an excellent point. I knew that I wanted to live and work in pretty exotic locales. I had no compunction mm -hmm. about studying abroad and I really liked the idea of living in some of these spaces where wildlife was a much larger part of kind of the national dialogue kind of thing. I will say that I definitely agree with you in terms of the translated experiences. If you are not wanting to live and work in sub-Saharan Africa within conservation research as a career, the value that this adds is really reduced because I do not feel like some of the research skills like radio telemetry might translate, but when you're in these situations, if you're working on one of these projects, it's not just the skills that you're learning. It's a lot of the network that you're doing, the networking that you're doing as well. And the networking over there, there's a strong likelihood that it might not translate into positive networking here in the United States. Mm -hmm. For example, if I wanted to go into carnivore conservation here in the United States, a lot of my experiences in sub-Saharan Africa might translate to a small degree, but really it wouldn't help mm -hmm. me in a way that it would not help me more than if I had just decided to start to do volunteer in the carnivore atmosphere here in the United States. Having lived in Africa for almost eight years at this point, most of my professional network is in sub-Saharan Africa, and therefore that professional networking as I've been building my career doesn't translate all that well into if I was just trying to get into high echelons of wildlife research in a very specific field like carnivore research here in the United States. If I had wanted to move in that direction, I would have been much better off trying to volunteer into one of those specific expertises or specific fields here in the United mm -hmm. States all that time that I've actually been networking in Africa. I love that you said that. I didn't even think about that angle. Don't get me wrong. I know I've been able to meet because the higher up you get in these specialties, for example, carnivore research, the more likely you are to meet other carnivore ecologists from different continents working in different areas or on different species. And that is helpful. But professional network is the strongest and most robust in the areas 
that I've spent all this time mm -hmm. working in, and I've started on that South African volunteerist experience. If you are planning on working slightly more close to home here in the United States, you would be better off volunteering here in the States, but it also might save you a lot of money because it is not cheap to be a volunteerist mm -hmm. in any of those spaces. On top of paying for the experience with this organization, there's also the pure logistics of having to get your way over there. Yeah. And flights are not cheap here in the United States, and they are really expensive when you're trying to fly to another continent. Yeah. And if this is something you want to do, I absolutely tell people to go for it. And if it's like a, just a cool experience they want to have, or even if they do still want it to contribute to their career. But I talk to people who really feel like they can't get anywhere because they can't afford to take one of these trips. And I'm like, no, you don't need that. If, I, depending on what your end goal is. I actually agree with that completely. Instead of paying for one of these experiences, if you're willing to put in the legwork and the elbow grease, it might be more beneficial to take a more specified approach to this. For example, if you know that you're interested in getting um, certain types of research experiences in one of these spaces, it might be a better policy to try to contact a researcher that you know is doing research over there and might be doing field research on a seasonal level or mm -hmm. maybe teaching a study abroad class there themselves as one of these researchers on site teaching these research skills instead of paying for a volunteerist experience. Because in, in both of these cases, you would be having to pay the initial inputs of finding your of getting your flight over there mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. But you might be able to get a more robust and true to the conservation field or mm -hmm. the wildlife research field experience if you were to accompany one of these professors as they're doing a field research exercise. And in addition, that might help get you more of a productive foot in the door that might prove to be fruitful later on. For example, if you do a good job as kind of one of these volunteering field assistants with a professor working in that field, it's a very high likelihood that they might be willing to write you a letter of recommendation, or they can put you in touch with other people that are working on things that you might be interested in if what you're interested in turns out not to be what that professor is working on. And it could enable you to have better professional connections later on that are buttressed by the fact that you now have a much more clear eyed view of what wildlife research looks like. That's great advice. And to wrap this up, I'd love for you to tell everyone what you work on now because you're getting your PhD and you do some really cool stuff. Yeah. So right now I'm at North Carolina State University. I'm in Dr. Roland Kay's lab. And a lot of the times I spend here at the Biodiversity Lab at the Museum of Natural Sciences here in Raleigh because that's where Roland's lab space is. Recently, I've been working on a collection of data that I collected from a national park in Zambia called Kasanka National Park, and that's in partnership with a local conservation organization that manages that park. So I've been able to have a lot of interactions with the Zambians who are looking for ways to quantify the productive outcomes of their conservation efforts, which has been really gratifying. I love working with local African organizations is it allows me to feel like I'm having a strong input into positive conservation outcomes that are generated by and pushed forward by local Zambian conservation needs. I'm also working on a data set from Namibia in partnership with the engineering program here where we have been having some of the engineers from the engineering school build us drones that allow us to monitor wildlife populations in some of these conservation spaces in Namibia because they are uh, particularly well suited for wildlife observation from drone platforms. So it's kind of using new tools to try to see if we can refine how wildlife monitoring is done in the field. Cool. And if people want to follow your research or interact with you, how can they do so? Yeah, people are welcome to get in touch with me on my Twitter. My handle is Soyen for Science. It's spelled the Maasai word for wild dog, which is S-U-Y 
I A N, and then the number four, and then science. And uh, yeah, they're welcome to interact with me there. Sometimes I, I post pictures of what I've been finding in my research or places that I've been working in, people I've been working with. And yeah, it's, I'm always welcoming people in terms of networking opportunities because I've been super fortunate in being able to network with people and ask questions about the field to gain a better understanding of how my interests might benefit from different perspectives or skill sets. Well, thank you so much, Matt. This was a great discussion and I'm so excited to see where you end up. I know you're going to have a really cool job. Thank you. I appreciate that. I always enjoy catching up with you, Stephanie. I benefited a lot from your experiences and perspectives when I came here to the lab initially. You were very welcoming. I'm always happy to pay it forward. Thanks. Thank you once again, Matt, for that interview. It was fantastic. I know it's going to help so many people. I'd like to point out one key takeaway from that interview. If you're thinking about doing one of these programs and you are on the fence, it is such a great idea to ask people who have been in this program already what it's like. And I think it's especially helpful to ask people who've been in the program maybe a few years ago so that they have some distance now from the program to see if their experiences that they gained really benefited them. Now, of course, if you want to do the program because you think it sounds fun and yes, it will help you, go ahead and do it. But if this is really something you financially can't afford but really feel like will help you, collect that data from those people, ask them, and ask them if it got them to the job that they wanted. Did it get them to their end goal? You always wanna think about your end goal, where you ultimately want to end up. Because if you have a volunteer experience in Africa, like Matt was saying, The things that you are going to learn there and the network that you're going to have there is going to be completely different. If you intend then to work for a nonprofit in the U.S. or the government, that was my goal. But I got my Ph.D. doing research in Gabon on forest elephants. It just might not translate. A lot of my network is in Africa. A lot of my experience is there, obviously. And what is on the ground there is not necessarily like what it's like here in the US too. In East Africa, where I also have a lot of experience, the land is very open and there's so much large mammal work where you can watch the animals. But here in the United States, You can do that out west, but you can't do that as much in other places of the U.S. So really, as best as you can, try to identify the job that you ultimately want so you can craft and get those experiences and network to get you there. I have a free tool to help you. Go to fancyscientist.com and search for job tracker. It is a spreadsheet and you use it to study the jobs now so that you can make sure you get the right stuff to get you there. Thanks again, Matt. I had a great time talking to you and I hope you all have an amazing day.